Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips and I'm going to cover two topics that I seem to cover all the time and I cover them all the time because people keep bringing them up and they keep arguing with me and sending me questions so here we go. I want to talk about vitamin D screening again and here's why this is new information. Um, a recent draft recommendation from the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force says there's not enough evidence to recommend screening healthy adults for vitamin D deficiency. The task force cautioned that available tests used to measure vitamin D levels may not be accurate. There is no internationally recognized standard or professional consensus on diagnostic criteria. They expressed concern about differences in the results between testing methods and even between laboratories that use the same testing methods. So this is an imprecise thing. That's the place we have to start with this. The task force recommended or reported that there have been no studies that have measured the benefits of testing for vitamin D deficiency in adults, but that the evidence is adequate that supplementation in asymptomatic vitamin D deficient adults has no benefit for cancer, type 2 diabetes, mortality, or fractures. The evidence is inadequate for other outcomes, including psychosocial or physical functions. Furthermore, the benefits of harms of screening and supplements cannot be determined at this time. The report's preliminary followed by a comment period and then they'll issue a final report and it would be great to say that once everybody reads the final report we'll stop all of this insane testing but actually that's not the way things work in medicine. People dig in their heels and keep doing stuff. Well, the task force mentioned that the evidence is insufficient to determine the harms associated with screening and supplementation but a growing number of studies are causes for concern. Um, a recent study looked at women who took calcium and vitamin D supplements and concluded that before taking these supplements, which are recommended to most women, I would say at this point in time, by doctors, particularly if they're postmenopausal, that they should be tested uh, before starting the pills, both, both blood and urine tests, and then every three months after starting to take the supplements. I mean, this is more testing than is recommended for people taking statin drugs to lower cholesterol. So anyway, the craze for high vitamin D levels and uh, calcium intake, particularly calcium intake, you can't reach the uh, recommended intakes unless you're drinking cow's milk, eating fortified foods, or taking supplements. So anyway, the way that the study was done, it was gold standard, randomized, double blind, blind and placebo controlled, 163 Caucasian women. They were followed for um, a year. And uh, all were deemed vitamin D deficient at the start of the study. And they were prescribed supplements that ranged from 400 to 4,800 international units a day or placebo. And then their dietary calcium intakes um, were analyzed and they were given enough supplementation to achieve intake of 1,200 milligrams a day. They did collect blood and urine samples every three months. And uh, what they basically found is that um, women who uh, took the supplements had increasingly higher risk of hypercalcemia and hyper, um, hypercalcemia. In other words, too much calcium in the blood and too much calcium in the urine. Um, in fact, women who had urine calcium levels above 132 milligrams had 15 times higher risk. And for those above 180 milligrams, 20 times higher risk. Risk. And so the researchers stated that these are common events for people who take calcium and vitamin D supplements. And here's a quote, whether they're caused by calcium alone or the combination of calcium with vitamin D, which by the way wasn't clear in the study, remains uncertain. But uh, certainly we should be using some caution um, when we prescribe these things. So uh, every week it seems we're getting more information about the inadvisability of testing for vitamin D and prescribing these supplements. And um, I mean, it's just turned into an industry at this point in time and it's hard to make a dent in it because unfortunately practitioners don't read and listen to this stuff. Now another topic we've talked about and we've talked about and we've talked about is drugs for attention deficit disorder. I've been advising against using these medications for years for many, many reasons. The diagnosis is subjective. The drugs don't improve outcomes. And let me just say for the record, I don't think drugging kids so that they sit still and focus is a positive outcome. I'm talking about outcomes like as they track into adulthood, do these kids actually function well? Do they, are they, do they grow out of this? I mean, they function worse. There's much worse function as they follow them over time. And then there are dangerous side effects. For example, one of the leading causes of bipolar disease in children, to the extent that this even exists, is the drugs that kids are given for attention deficit disorder. Now, this particular study I want to talk about today is the largest study of its kind. It involves 700,000 children, Danish children, 
who were followed for nine and a half years. And what this showed was that um, the, the drugs increase the risk of cardiovascular disease and events in children and, uh, and adolescents. Uh, the most commonly reported events included arrhythmias, hypertension, ischemic heart disease, pulmonary heart disease, cardiac arrest, and heart failure. That's a pretty scary list when we're talking about children and adolescents. The study showed that it was dose dependent. The higher the doses the kids took, the more likely they were to have these events. They also reported that rapid drops in medication were problematic and increased the risk as well as opposed to more gradual withdrawal. Now studies besides this one have shown that drugs used to treat attention deficit disorder increase both blood pressure and heart rate, so this is not really surprising. What I find incredibly surprising, well two things actually, one is how willing doctors still are to prescribe them and how willing doctors are to defend the drugs. And this is going to infuriate you. I know it infuriated me when I read it. Arthur Westover, a psychiatrist with the University of Texas, criticized the study because the researchers included any kind of cardiovascular event without consideration for how serious the events were. He said, therefore, the results may not be clinically meaningful. Are you kidding me? I think all cardiovascular events in young children are clinically meaningful. Cardiovascular disease, is, we used to think of that as something that affected older people. He also commented, and this is classic, the study didn't show an increased risk of death. So I guess as long as the kiddos are alive with heart disease at the age of six or eight or 10, um, that we don't have to worry about their health status. I mean, I, I think these comments border on irresponsible, and I can't imagine anybody wanting to have a comment or comments like these associated with their name. The proper response to this information, stop the insanity, stop prescribing the drugs. There are better ways to get kids to sit still and focus than giving them drugs that induce heart disease and heart attacks. All right, that's all for today. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it, and I will be back to you again next week with more news.